Welcome back, everybody, to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. I'm author and ghost historian Mike Ricksecker. With me, as always, is my co-hostess, Vanessa Hogel. And down in the chat room is our chat shenanigator, Shauna. Sort of. Um, be easy on her. Be gentle. She's been sick here the past couple of weeks, so she'll kind of be in and out of chat. So behave, all of you down there. So we have a fantastic guest up with us tonight here on the rabbit hole. That is Michelle Freed. Michelle's a graduate of the Alternative Practitioner Academy in Arlington Heights, Illinois, received certification from the National Guild of Hypnotism and is fully certified in all forms of controlled remote viewing. She's been featured in the documentary Third Eye Spies and has appeared on an episode of Ancient Aliens. Also, Michelle is a producer for Midnight in the Desert Radio, which I was recently on. Uh, you can also visit Michelle's website. I've put the link down in the description below, so be sure to check that out after the show. Michelle, welcome. Great to have you aboard. Me too. Um, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm obsessed with remote viewing. So anytime I get to talk about it, I'm in. Well, let's just yeah. dive right in. <laughs> yeah, I this is fit. Said. Yeah, I said I I told him um <laughs> when we were setting everything up, Vanessa can run with it for a while since Vanessa, our co-hostess, is also a remote viewer. So Vanessa and Michelle have a lot in common. I'll pop in and then I'll ha I have a lot of questions for Michelle anyway. So, um, but Vanessa, I know you want to dive right in. You guys had already stoked up a great conversation. So go ahead and f feel free to roll. With I it. do. I do. I, I am rolling. Okay. Uh, Michelle, again, I want, I want to let everybody know how unbelievably excited I am to have you on here because as I stated when we were off air, it is a rarity to have somebody on that, that does this particular skill. It's you, even though you and I both talked about it and how everybody has a capability, very few do it. I have my own opinions about hmm. why very few people do it. I would love to know yours. Oh, um, why very few people do remote viewing? Um, in, well, I think, you know, we're both talking about remote viewing, but we both have a little bit of a different way that we do it. So um, the way that I do remote viewing is um, called controlled remote viewing, which is a protocol that was set up by our government and the military. Um, Russell Targ, Hal Putoff, and Ingo Swan put together a protocol, and this is pretty much what I follow. And um, so it takes uh, a lot of practice and dedication and determination um, on one level. The other level is that um, you have to get over, um, kind of get out of your head to do it. You cannot, we have a, a term called AOL, analytical overlay, and that's when you name something. It's because as humans, we want everything to make sense. And sometimes information comes to us in a way that is symbolic or um, I guess symbolic. It comes in bits and pieces. And Joe McMonigal, um, who is one of the uh, best remote viewers in the military, he always says that to be a world-class remote viewer, you need to give up um, being human and meaning uh, what makes sense. And um, my uh, mentors are always yelling at me and telling me, you know, Michelle, you know, your session can't be like a cute little bow and everything makes sense and wrapped up in a pink bow. Uh, so you have to be OK with uncertainty. Um, so that those are a couple of reasons. I, I think it's um, like a martial art. I think a lot of people use that analogy, too. Well, and while you and I might go about this in different ways, the end result generally is the same. And I, I have always found when I'm speaking to people about remote viewing and the different things that I've seen and, and, and how I process what I'm seeing, you're absolutely correct. You have to take sense out of it. You have to be okay with saying something that sounds utterly ridiculous to you and, and saying it with confidence because it's going to make sense to somebody else, you know, when, when it needs to. But I've also found that it's fear because mm. let's face it, Michelle, when, when we remote view, there is no guarantee of what we're going to see. Mm -hmm. And certain things can be very disturbing. And that is one of the things that I found 
to be most profound when people discuss this is they don't want to see that. You know, hmm. if they could pick what they see, that would be great. But you can't. Right. Right. How do, how think, do you deal with that? Um, so we have um, people that uh, so the way that remote viewing in the protocol um is set up is you have a manager who will put together tasking. And if you trust the person that's giving you tasking, that they're going to give you something that's safe, um, then you can go all in. Um, I think the biggest fear, because when you said fear, it was fear of failure. <laughs> so it wasn't uh. fear of what I'm going to see. It was more like, I don't want to fail. I don't want to get wrong data. Um, so I think it, you know, it's a little different because we set it up um, in a scientific kind of um, format. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think because we do that, um, now there are times when we will remote view crimes, but we know ahead of time that it's going to be a crime. So we prepare for that. Um, and there's a, also some aspect of the session where we, um, that's built in where you break away at the end, you know, you detach from the session. Um, so it seems to me like all the people that created this process pretty much thought of everything. And, um, so we just kind of follow along and do our thing um, and uh, and hope for the best. Wow. That, that would be, I don't know what I would do <laughs> if, if I had, if I had those options. <laughs> you would, you would probably do brilliant, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, you might have an issue because I do get a lot of students in my classes that I tell them you have to forget all your other modalities. Mm -hmm. Learn this, okay, just like it's fresh and, and new. And then you can put everything together, you know, take all that you know and then merge it all together. Because for someone like you who um, has your way of doing it, you can always add something to your toolbox mm -hmm. and you might find some things in this kind of, pro you know, there are some people that don't like the structure and, um, but there are some, uh, you know, uh, how it's broken down in phases There are some phases that could actually be helpful to what you do. And you can kind of put it in there. Um, when I'm teaching remote view viewing, I have a structure, but I let, I, I want people to move around. I want them to make it their own. So we do kind of learn the structure pretty strict, but then I'm constantly saying, you know, once you get this and you can move around the way you want. So, um, that's, yeah. And, um, what you're doing is more like a freestyle, I think, you know, where you just kind of sit down and just let it go. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> but for people that may have a fear of what you're talking about, they may like to do it this way, yeah. where you have somebody you trust that has a defined um, tasking that's telling, you know, um, we, it's a secret question. It's something that they're not going to know about because when we remote view, we're blind. In fact, um, we had a project. Um, my manager called me up and said, okay, Michelle, I have a project, but I can't even tell you who's hiring us. And I'm like, oh my gosh, because if they tell me who's hiring, then I might be a little jaded in my session. Mm -hmm. So this happens sometimes. So it turned out that it was Tom DeLong. Do you know who Tom DeLong is? He um, he works, uh, he started the Stars Academy right. you know, for the UFO research. Mm -hmm. Mike, you know who that yeah, is, Yeah, right? I know Tom DeLong, yeah. Okay, so he hired us to do, and it turned out I did get aliens, of course. Um, <laughs> of course. But I had no, I had no idea that, um, you know, it was him or what the question was. So, um, so we're completely blind, and again, I think it's all about trust, you know. So that would that would be so strange for me. I have to ask you what sounds like the silliest of questions, but. <laughs> excuse me, given what you're talking about and the way that you do it and the different organizations that you work for, is that the reason that years ago I was asked by somebody, <laughs> I'm not going to say who, but it was somebody, um, 
at a high government level if I was registered. Registered. You mean a registered remote viewer or yeah. like certified? That would, uh, that's a term. Did they yeah, say registered? My, they said certified. registered. If I had they, given, if my name was given to the military is what they asked me. Oh, um, it could, it could be that they wanted to know if you knew the protocol because um, sometimes um, they want everybody uh, pretty consistent in how they turn in their sheets because sometimes, you know, things get po political and, and everything oh, yeah. has to, especially, you know, if you think about the military, it makes sense that they would have a protocol. You know, it makes sense that, you know, you start with a little cool down, you start with this, you do this, then you do that. Everything's in writing, everything's documented. Um, and it, it's in a line with that. And um, so you have the controlled remote viewing, which is follows that military protocol. But the one I do is more of a civilian, and um, it was created by a couple people back in the 90s when remote viewing was just declassified. Mm -hmm. And so they did more, they kind of got rid of a lot of military weird terms and made it more approachable for regular people. And um, the other thing is that we engage our bodies, um, which uh, is really important, is um, really tapping into all of our senses. And, you know, from, from doing this session, we ask ourselves, okay, what does it smell like? What does it taste like? Um, we get our butt out of the chair and we move around and we walk. What do we see? What do we feel? You, your hands end up coming out. And some people that are so amazing can actually I, bilocate where they're actually there, you mm -hmm. know, making contact with the target. And um, it's fascinating with the potential that we can do. Any question you have in the whole entire world, you can answer using remote viewing. And, you know, some people I tell them, just, you know, make a whole list of questions and um, put a, a target number on it, just a random number on it, stick it in a hat and practice. Pull one out, you don't look at it, you know, just look at the number and then just do a session. And because you don't know what the tasking is, what you don't know what the question is, you're going to have um, pretty true information. Um, I, um, <coughs> the partner that I work with, um, asked me, you know, what foods should Michelle stay away from? That was actually my, the question. I didn't know that at the time, but I did my session. It was interesting because I was, I thought, when I was doing it, I was getting some kind of like um, genetically engineered humans. And so I think I was trying to, and something artificial intelligent. So these words like artificial GMOs, like I was telling myself to stay away from artificial food, GMOs, um, something spongy came up. I was describing something and I'm thinking that maybe I was describing mushrooms. Maybe I shouldn't be eating mushrooms or taking, eat, you know, eating mushrooms, if you know what I mean. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. Right, just, right. I don't know, but it was telling me something squishy. So I was kind of thinking it was mushrooms. Um, but anything in the whole, you can even ask yourself to go into a past life and bring something forward, bring something here that will help you be a better remote viewer, be a better person or, or something. It's just, incredible that's why i love it so much that's why i'm like crazy fanatic and you're saying anybody <laughs> yes, can do we this like crazy anybody can do this anybody um you know this is just um using you know parts that we don't use every day you know we have everybody has an innate intuition we everybody has it but sometimes we we don't always use it a lot of times throughout our day um, we'll get messages and we just dismiss them because we're just going from point A to B to C to D. Yeah, we get wrapped and, up in our lives, right? Yeah. You know, I get up, I'm eating breakfast, I work, but symbols and messages, and we spoke a little earlier about even manifestations, they're all coming at you all the time. And we just, eh, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. eh. And we're constantly doing that. But if we slow down, 
um, you know, the slow, slow motion camera and we start waking up. I guess that could be a good analogy. It's like wake up and be aware then you can see all the things coming at you and then you take advantage of them. You know, simple lessons that I tell my kids all the time that if you put yourself in an environment, magic happens, you know, they think I'm crazy, but I, they're like, Oh mommy, life isn't magical. Yeah, it is. It is. It is magical. Every, Every aspect of it is magical, good, bad, or indifferent. Right. Exactly. And, um, but I, you know, and that's what happens like crazy, crazy things can happen if you wake up and you just, um, you just are aware and that's what you're tapping into when you're remote viewing. <coughs> Ooh, the cough. I got it crazy. Let me, uh, let me ask you this. Um, cause you've mentioned it a couple times here with, with the military. Um, there was, you know, the old, uh, Project Stargate from long ago that I guess it was classified for a while and it ended up getting uh, declassified, made public. So is that where this really got started or, you know, there's some other origins here? Um, well, got there in, in, oh, this is, that's um, interesting that you're asking. Um, yeah, what we know, it started there, but um, I've had several guests on Midnight in the Desert where um, I do a pre-interview before I bring them on to the show. And one, t- I don't remember who it was right now, but he was somebody that um, I think he talks about, he talked about something from the past, like maybe it was folklore or something. Um, And he brought up several examples of people doing remote viewing, but didn't really call it that. Like they were um, one person. And was it was I think during World War One maybe, and where it was a husband and wife, and they would write letters to each other or something, hmm. and she was it ended up that she was remote viewing, but they, there was not really a word for it. Okay, um, right. So I think that this remote viewing that we're talking about has been around for a very long time, but when I'm talking about the protocol and the scientific um, evidence or scientific frame, I would say that um, it came from, you know, Stargate, Um, but also other countries before we did it, other countries were playing around with it, China and Russia and, and things like that. So we weren't, you know, necessarily the creators of it, but um, we, we definitely are a part of it. Well, yeah, we wanted to take advantage of it. I mean, just like the other countries back in the day, and well, even now, I suppose <laughs> we wanted to, you know, spy yeah. on spy on the other countries, spy on our enemies at the time, especially during the Cold War. Um, so, is that something? Now, Project Stargate, from my understanding, is no longer in operation. But is this something that's still being used by the military? Do you know? Well, um, I don't know, but I have my suspicions. <laughs> they closed down. St- Stargate is done. Um, but I think that they may have evolved and going into different areas. In fact, that could be something we would remote view. We might get in trouble for remote viewing something like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you probably could, and I'm sure some people have. Um, but I'm sure that, you know, I don't, because it worked and they proved that it worked, I don't think that it stopped there. They have to be working on um, probably the next phase, you know, the next, uh, jump. I know that a lot of organizations like Ryan Institute and IONS and all these other places, they're experimenting with, um, psychokinesis Hmm. and, um, a, a lot of other things too. So it makes me wonder, like, if, if we're doing that as civilians, um, they must be doing something in there. Um, so yeah it's like you just said earlier you know there are certain people um that can bilocate during remote viewing and that this that doesn't just mean it in my own words that they can be here and there they can manipulate both areas they hmm. they they can i mean i've i've been involved in remote viewing in other countries where that's been exactly the case where i could manipulate the situation there 
and I'm sitting on my couch in Oklahoma. So if little old me can do something like that, I can guarantee you that somebody that has more time on their hands can take it one step further or two steps further, or three steps further. So I think it only stands to reason that that is still happening today. Yeah, you know, I know that, you know, there's some other areas of remote viewing. Um, very interesting. There's something called ARV. Um, it's associated remote viewing, associative, associated remote viewing. And they're using this for targets where you want to pick A or B. And so they're using it for sporting events and financials. Um, so, you know, does the stock go up or down? Uh, does team A or B win? And what they're finding from, I mean, this is sort of new. I mean, I guess relatively new to be using it for this. What's interesting about it is that you're literally, in order to do this, you have to move into the future and bring the information back to the past. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know that there are other people that have done, um, one of my teachers, John Vivanco, he, back in the 90s, he, they were working on counter uh, terrorism. So that was another thing where they had to go into the future, get information and bring it back. The thing that they learned is that they were changing the future by going into the future. So this is again, like similar to this whole idea of the double um, slit theory, where if you observe something, it changes. So um, this is, you know, a definitely interesting thing. It's a big, huge conversation when this starts going and you have all these really smart people talking you just sit there with your eyes open and your jaw you know like on the floor and you're just like whoa well you yeah know, you're you talking about time traveling is really is what it comes down to we're time yeah it's like we're doing that you know and we're changing it but well let me is, ask let me ask you this then um <laughs> if you're remote viewing into what we would call the future is it perhaps um, happening concurrently. Like there are some theories out there that the past, future, and present are all concurrently happening. So do you believe that's the case? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> to a degree, no, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I think a lot, remote viewing is really a lot about intention. So okay. it's like, if there's a game going to be next weekend, um, if there's a game going to be on next week and my intention is that, well, the way that it's set up is that um, you're actually remote viewing two photos that represent both teams. And the two photos are completely opposite of each other, like just different so that we can determine which one you're looking at. Um, and that's how we make our predictions. I'm just doing it, you know, explaining it very right. quickly. Um and so what we tell ourselves when we remote view that is go to the photo that will be shown to me after the game is played. So mm -hmm. our intention is to move into the future until after the game is played. And the photo that they're going to show us is obviously the one for the winning team. So that's the one I should be describing on my paper. So um, I, you know, my intention, so I, I, go through the the um, <laughs> the portal to the future. I grab all the information about this photo. I sketch and draw it on my paper. I turn it into the group manager with several other people and they make a prediction, which team, which picture we were looking at, because they know we don't. And then they make the prediction and the game's won, yay, and then we get to see the picture. Um, and that's our feedback and it, it creates a feedback loop. So then, then after we, after the game's played and we get the picture, we're literally sending our information back by looking at that picture there. So that, does that make sense? I don't know if it's kind of hard. Yeah, I, I get it. Um, I, no, I understand what you're, <clears throat> let me, I guess maybe mm -hmm. throw it back at you, see if I understand it correctly. So you have two ideas of what could possibly happen in this situation. And you're basically throwing both of those out there for lack of a better term to the universe. And whichever one comes back to you is the one you believe is going to happen. And is that pretty much it? 
Um, not quite. Not like, quite. Okay. <laughs> here, I'll, I'll do it better. Here, I'll do it. I'll do it better. So you have, um, I'm from Chicago, so I always have to use the Cubs. Okay. So you have the Cubs and the Cardinals. Okay. So <clears throat> your manager will uh, find a picture of, um, the ocean, uh, that represents the Cubs. And then you find a picture of the desert, um, that represents the Cardinals. And, um, so then we don't know about that. The viewer does not know about these pictures. We know that there are two pictures and we know that one of the pictures is going to be shown to us after the game. Okay. And they're only going to show us the one that represents the team that won. So when we, we get an email that gives us a target number, um, it's a random group of numbers that kind of gives us something to focus on. We tell ourselves, okay, Michelle, go into the future after the game's played and sketch and draw the photo that they're going to show me. I do my session and then um, I send it, I email it back to them and they make a prediction and they see that everybody had some kind of water in their session. So they okay. determine that, oh, the Cubs are going to win. So they put money five dimes they put money on the cup this is all to make money got it <laughs> i'm kidding hello <laughs> mama needs a new pair of shoes right right <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so then uh the cubs win of course uh and then they send me the picture of the ocean and i'm like woohoo i won um and that's that that's how we do it so um we did a peer reviewed uh experiment and it will be in i think it's even in there now uh the journal for for cyclical 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 research mm -hmm. um so it's been published there where we used our dreams to predict a future outcome so we use this whole technique we just added dreams to it so um we set an intention on a friday night that we're going to dream of the photo we wake up do the session and then the the whole thing. And we had, I think it was like a 60 something percent hit rate. So, you know, it's okay. over 50. So it yeah. was something substantial. That's so. interesting that you use dreams because I do have um, periodic premonitions, but I can never tell how far in advance it's going to be. Sometimes it might be a month, week, year, whatever. So it's kind of interesting you've worked in that as well. But um, what is the, uh, you, you, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to, I have a suggestion for you. If you um, take control of that and set an intention before you go to sleep, um, you know, where you give yourself a range of time, dream about something that's going to happen between this and this, you can start, um, you know, training yourself to know when these things are going to happen. Everything seems, everything is about intention. If you set that intention, it's going to happen. Okay. I'll try that. I will try that. Uh, but, but you, you I'm keep referring back with you. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you keep referring to an organization and, and a group. So are, are you allowed to, you know, kind of talk about that a little bit and what that group oh, is? Oh, who I work with? Yeah. Um, it's nothing formal. It's just a group. Well, the organization is apply um applied precognition project. They okay. are working on um, they're working on the um. Uh, the ARV remote viewing, the other projects I work on, they're private groups that we have. We don't really have a name. We're unnamed. We're unmarked. Okay. Um, and um, so, yeah. And, um, and then there's other, you know, we get projects all the time. We even get people from companies that ask us to predict financials for them oh, okay. so and um there's just a whole bunch of re re remote viewers and um whoever's available you know let, let's get let's do this project so that that brings me back to something just <clears throat> what you were telling mike about you know setting up before you go to bed giving yourself a time slot for the dreams um that brings part a twofold thing for one thing. What I mean, I think that that's great. I tell people to do something very similar, but you also have to be careful because certain things just need to happen. So mm -hmm. if you're doing it so that you might find something and you can stop it, 
really think about that. And then you lead into this with organizations coming to you, see if you can predict financials and stuff that, that really straddles the line. I think, you mm -hmm. know, just personally on, on ethics, because there, to me, there was a reason this should be done and there was a reason it shouldn't be done mm -hmm. and it should not be done for profit. Right. A lot of people, I mean, there is, there is that, um, I get that comment a lot um, from people. I think that, um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't even know what to say about that. Um, a couple things. Um, one thing is that I know that the Applied Precognition Project, the reason they're not making big bucks, they're just doing, you know, little wagers and bets and, and the guy that runs it, his name is Marty Rosenblatt. And he, he believes that in order to get the attention of the world, you have to have something about money involved because nobody will take you seriously unless you're doing these projects. Um, and you know, people are making money. Then people sit up because you tell me when, when you tell someone you're psychic, and that these things are real. The first thing they say to me and a lot of people is, well, then why didn't you win the lottery? I laugh, laugh at yeah. well, we, <laughs> I laugh at But them. we say, right, but we say you people do win the lottery. Like we have evidence people do win the lottery. So in that way, I think, you know, I think it's a good thing. You know, um, when people come to us and they want to know about financials, you know, the thing is, is that any psychic or remote viewing and all that, it's not a done deal. It's not, there is so, it's so complicated. So it's, it's really work and it's really using, you know, intuition. It, it, it's equivalent to me to somebody having a feeling like, oh, I feel like the bears are going to win or I feel, and all we're doing is we have a protocol for it. And I don't think that's unethical to like go with your gut feeling. We're just kind of writing it down and we're helping people out. And then they choose if they want to listen to the information that we have. You know, some people have a better, they're more in touch with their gut feelings and things like that. But we make decisions like that every day. Um, you know, should we do this? Should we do that? Um, and I don't know why money is a bad thing. Like why, if we want to manifest things, why not let, let this help us, um, get money or what wealth or health or any of it. Cause we use this for health too. We can use remote viewing to find, um, an illness. We can uh -huh. find, um, you know, what's wrong with people, a tumor, a location of a tumor. Um, we can also use it to um, describe a, a criminal, you know, like say he's missing a finger and his name is Nine Finger Phil. And um, I cracked myself up. <laughs> Nine Finger Phil. <laughs> oh my God. Um, <laughs> it, just, it totally reminded um, me of Frodo with the nine one. fingers. I mean, I just, okay. Not nine. <laughs> <laughs> Nine finger Phil. Nine oh my gosh. Phil. Nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Need to have that on a t-shirt now. <laughs> yeah. Nine finger Phil. Uh, I have a story. When I used to direct musical theater. Um, we were doing Peter Pan and we hired a company in Vegas to come out to Chicago to fly Peter. And the guy comes in with missing a finger and his name was Phil. Oh. And so I called him nine. <laughs> uh, yeah. So gotcha. And, 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 the, and the story wouldn't be great unless you knew that he lost his finger by flying people. So oh. that's how huh? he lost the finger. Interesting. Yeah, I guess, you know, the cable, it got caught. So Ooh. and then I had a visual of his finger floating in the pulley. I don't know. Just oh, I that's, 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 that's <laughs> kind of gruesome. Pulley. Wow. Uh, I'm sitting there thinking, how so, the hell did the guy lose his finger on a plane? You said no. flying, people. flying, yeah, no, <laughs> flying Peter. With the <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, I'm all right, That's I got true. it. <laughs> well, actually, actually, it was a psychic version of Peter Pan, and we like, 
<laughs> and we just levitated Peter. Okay, so let's. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we do have a bunch of questions coming out of the chat room. They have been ever since we um, started. So I do want to okay. get to some of these because uh, <clears throat> there are quite a few. So I have to actually scroll back up here. Um, okay. From this is for, oh okay Chuck has one up here um, from Chuck Banks. Have you ever done a remote viewing session and had a person doing the same thing that ended the session? Huh? Yeah. Wait, it, it it sounds like and I hit you with a weird one to start with, but it was the first question. And I like to try and do them in order. Okay. Um, it sounds like one remote viewer and there's a second one and they're trying to remote view at the same time and it I guess short circuit each other. Um, no, um, okay. we, I mean, we work, um, we work together a lot. Like we'll have a team all working at the same time. Um, and, um, one of the very important things is that, that you have to be disciplined that you're not remote viewing somebody else's, um, uh, session that you're staying focused again, your intention, that you're focused on that secret question, the tasking of what you're assigned to do. And your subconscious is like a little kid and it wants to like be naughty and go to the other people's sessions. So it's, uh, you know, another discipline that you have to learn, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> to stay focused on the tasking. So I don't, I'm not sure if, um, I'm not sure if, that's what they mean. Chuck, but. if you're still down there, please let us know. <laughs> um, Sandra Griffin was wondering, when you're remote viewing, what all can you see? What all can I see? Um, like, I guess maybe uh, some examples of what you see when you're remote view. Like, How does it look? Okay, so we don't necessarily see. It's more, we use our senses, so it's more feeling. A lot okay. of like a knowing, a feeling. You know, those those bursts of information that kind of like when you just know something, you can't describe how you know it, but it just comes in a flash. Um, and sometimes we'll see um, it would be equivalent to like if somebody took a photo and um, flashed it in front of your face in a second and then the imprint is what you have left. So you would see very low level descriptions like you would see a curved line or you might see a color or a shape or something like that and then as you progress through your session um it's almost like things start to come alive hmm. as as you go but you're engaging your body and you know like for example one time i didn't know this because i was blind but i ended up remote viewing bigfoot and oh, wow. so i was <laughs> i <coughs> It was the Patterson Gimlin uh, footage. And the question was, you know, is this a hoax or the real thing? And so I had a monitor at the time. So a monitor is somebody that um, will, you're doing your session, but they will kind of prompt you with questions, but they have, they can't be leading questions. So basic, so my monitor said, okay, stand up. I'm like, stand, okay, touch your body. So basically... You know, I'm already in session. I already have some information. I was getting that um, I started out with a subject. That's the first thing I'm like, there's a subject here. Um, and I sensed it to be female. And then it was weird because my thoughts were going, you know, it's a big woman, like a basketball player. I kept thinking like I wanted to switch it to male instead of hmm. female, but something in me said female. So I kept it. And then he's like, okay, touch your body. And I touched my arm and I'm like, Ooh, my arm feels really hairy. Oh. And so I, I just started, you know, I started becoming Bigfoot. I guess. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I, <laughs> um, but I was starting to get feelings, you know, touch your head, touch, you know, whatever. Um, and I, I was starting to get more by touching myself. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to let it drop. Normally sounds like a divinal song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Um, 
<laughs> I was getting more information. Basically, I was it was get, giving me more information. OK, next. <laughs> OK, I have to ask you and I'm, I'm joking, joking around here, of course. But was that image blurry? Because we're talking Bigfoot here. It like I'm saying, I didn't see, I didn't see that hairy arm. You just felt I, it. I felt it. Okay. I, it's hard to describe. Um, that's, I mean, that's what's encouraged when we're remote viewing, and it doesn't always happen. Like when you see something, the problem is, um, and this is a common example. So, um, say I had an apple here, and I asked you to describe the apple. You would say things like red, shiny, round, sure. curved. But what if the target was a fire truck? Okay, so we want to avoid naming things. So yeah, we don't still red and shiny, it, right? Right. We don't want to. Um, we we don't want to name things, and we just want to describe them. So um, it's a very important thing because that goes back to what I said in the beginning that as humans we want everything to make sense. Right. And to me, red, shiny, round is an apple but then say you start getting something you know tubular hollow okay so then you're going to say a banana or is it a fire hose mm. and if you're remote viewing some kind of crime and the fire truck is important you're going to be describing a fruit basket that's not going to get <laughs> you <laughs> it's not going to get you what you need so it's important that we um really tap into our senses and let the target come to us and just describe. So I hope that helps. <clears throat> oh, that was good. I, that was very informative. Um, get. I'll take one more here, and then Vanessa. I know you have some stuff um, from Tom. <laughs> Mc, <laughs> from Tom McNicholas. What is the difference between remote viewing and an out of body experience? In remote viewing, we generally do not leave our bodies. We're. Um, uh, and I'll tell you, this is an interesting thing that happened. Um, I was at Robert, um, the Monroe Institute. Uh, are you familiar with Monroe Institute? I'm not. Okay. So it's um, Robert Mon Monroe with the, you know, the hemi-sync, the binaural beats. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm familiar with that. Okay. Yeah. So he, he was a creator of that and it oh, helps okay. you sync up your left brain and right brain, like a brain entrainment thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of remote viewers use that. Um, and it also, he teaches you, well, he's, he's passed now, um, but they're still running it and they teach you techniques of outer body experiences. So I was there, um, for a week, uh, learning and there was a lady there that does mus muscle testing. And I wanted to do an experiment where I wanted to know if we are out of our body when we're remote viewing. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so I grabbed her and we did an, our own unofficial experiment. And, uh, so what she did, she made me lay on the floor and she did the muscle testing so that she had the baseline. Uh, and then I did a, a session, a remote viewing session, and then she did it again. And, it turned out that when she first um, did the muscle testing, I was out of my body. But then remote viewing actually grounded me. Hmm. I was in my body, which makes sense because you're focused. You know, you're tap. You're you're very focused and and um, and you know doing your thing. But even having said all that, there are people that, like I said, bilocate or they do leave their body. There's different techniques of remote viewing called ERV, uh, which it has a, a element of hypnosis where you kind of go into a very deep state and then you are, you know, going to the location and describing it, probably very similar to what Vanessa does. Yeah, um, it sounds like it. may leave her body for that. But in the one I do, we don't really usually leave our body. It's, it's weird. Um... Because all of the different things that you're talking about, I, I can relate to them, but I don't fit any of them. And that's because, I mean, I can be cooking dinner, be in my body, remote view for a team in England and give them a visual, physical description mm -hmm. of what I'm seeing. So it isn't, it's not that the other senses aren't being used, but I see it. Right. I, mean, right. I can I can describe the person. 
right that they're you know that that it is about i can i can give the name i can describe the location that they're at so i don't understand where i fit in am i just a freak no i think <laughs> you know i think that the the word uh the label remote viewing is probably not a good you know, and we've all talked about this, remote viewing. Sometimes we're wondering if they should have called it remote sensing, you know, or put a different word on it because it is confusing. You know, whenever I talk to people and I, I ask them, have you heard of remote viewing? Um, they're, oh, yeah, yeah, I do it all the time. And, and I'm like, uh, is it, you know, the military one, like controlled remote viewing? Oh, no, no. So they're, you know, so I think it's, the um you are not a freak at all you're kind of cool you're pretty cool <laughs> Thank you. i mean that's great <laughs> uh, what you're doing is fantastic i mean it's you know i just think that um i think they're different things you're tapping tapping into a different frequency a different level or whatever you want to call it um and it's you know great if you don't need to do the, you know, this way, but it's also great to do it this way too. Mm -hmm. So um, they're just tapping into, I guess, frequencies, like different frequencies. But again, you know, I think it's the name. Remote viewing is confusing. Yeah. It's just, it's the easiest one to, to, <coughs> to, to slap on the door, you know? I mean, so that's what I've always used. I prefer, I'm Vanessa and I know shit. I prefer yeah, that. I like that. But that's too big for the nameplate. So we have to have something, you know, to put out there. So it's always just been remote viewing, but it's, it, it is still, even I've done this my entire life and it's still confusing for me. So mm -hmm. I can only imagine how confusing it is for people that are just starting out. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I do my best to give advice and to try to help people, but I just, I don't, I, I know not everybody opens up this package the same way. Right. That's yeah. And I think, you know, it's important to respect that because, um, you know, nobody's better or worse or this kind of thing ebbs and flows. I mean, you know, you could have a good run and have, you know, do really well and then just crash and, you know, kind of do horrible. And then and then you come back and then you do better. So it's not a for sure thing. It's just not it's uh, it's just very fragile that i think i think that's what i would say it's just fragile like your mood in that day if you have if you're off that day you might not do as well you might not be able to tap in you know like you would well so, that's what i tell people when it comes to this when it comes to tarot when it comes mm -hmm. to anything that i do if i already feel like i'm not going to be on my game I ain't doing it. Right. Right. I'm not doing it. Um, and I tell, I will tell people I'm not your gal today. Right. I don't have it in me. I don't have the strength. I've busted my ass at work. You need, you deserve better. Mm -hmm. Find somebody yeah. else for today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's a responsibility when you do something like this, because so many people just want the accolades for being able to do it and forget the purpose of doing it. Exactly. Yeah. It's true. Um, yeah, I think um, also um, the other area that I always wonder about is this um, subjective and, you know, per perspectives. Um, that always, I, that's a big question for me. I'm always wondering about um, subjective, like symbols that you, you get um, if you're doing a reading on somebody versus somebody kind of you guiding, like in hypnosis, we guide someone to do their own ready, reading in, in a way, um, you know, because we're just guiding them and they take us, you know, like they drive the car. We just light the way. And I look at somebody doing a psychic reading versus somebody in hypnosis. Um, and I, there's this area of, um, if I'm reading somebody, something that is common for me might not be common for someone else. Uh -huh. Um, so it's, um, so that's also another thing that makes me wonder, like, how do we like ascertain what's what in things like what things mean? 
Well, and the thing that that I want a lot of people to understand that happens to people that that have this particular skill set, and not not just being psychic or reading cards or being a medium or, or doing remote viewing is that not everybody that comes to you has, has good intentions. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I would, I would not have to practice dentistry if I had $5 for every time somebody came to me asking me to spy on somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is my son so having an affair, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will shut that shit down right there. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. It's not my job. That is your problem to deal with. I'm not your gal. Yeah, I get it's that. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. And I think people need to understand that. It's not, this isn't a pretty game. Yeah, I like to, you know what? I like to, like you, uh, like to use remote viewing in a productive way. Something that's going to help the world. Something that's going to help people. And, um, you know, get answers to the big questions and and all that. So, Yeah. Is that how you deal with that? Or what do you say to people that come to you about that? They don't. Uh, we're not, you know, we don't know. We don't, it's not <laughs> kind of set up that you're, way. <laughs> you're not counseling. Yeah. we're. It's yeah. You're more of like a counselor type. We're more of like operational targets and it's just, you know, it's just framed differently. That's why. Um, yeah. But if I had a client for hypnosis, um, and then we're working on habits, you know, changing people's habits and stuff like that. So yeah. I have a question for you on hypnosis. Okay. I got hypnotized. I was okay. I'm 47 now. So this would have been 27, no, uh, 30 years ago. And yes, I wasn't, I wasn't of age, but I was in a nightclub. Um, I got hit. Naughty, naughty. I know. Right. This is my life. Um, I got hypnotized and it was funny um, because I was watching myself be hypnotized. You know what I mean? I okay. was out in the audience watching myself being hypnotized and I shocked okay. myself because I'm up on stage with all these different people and this person is trying to hypnotize us and it's working. I'm actually, and I have a very strong mind and I'm actually able to be hypnotized, but only to a certain point. He kept telling all of us, it's getting hotter. It's getting hotter. It's getting hotter and trying to get us to take off our jackets or something like that. Oh, geez. Somewhere in my subconscious in that strong mind knew the blouse I was wearing was inappropriate. And so I pulled my jacket tighter and fanned myself. And they had this on videotape and I was fully hypnotized. Yeah, your subconscious will not allow you to do what you don't want to do. Um, so that Wait, is a huge, down. yeah, that's huge. Yeah. like if you have a secret, like I tell my clients, like if you have a deep, dark, you know, skeleton in the closet and you don't want me to know, your subconscious won't allow you to tell me. So, um, you know, you always have control. Hypnosis is just really a state of being and then we leverage it by giving you suggestions and you're always in control of it so um it makes sense we might have to try that someday <laughs> uh, it would be fun i love it i'll be your guinea pig we'll see I love what we come up with here we go. All right. <laughs> yeah, I do want to get to uh, a few more of these questions from the uh, viewers before we go, because we are getting right down to the last few minutes of the show. It's gone by quick. We knew and, we were gonna. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and everybody has loved the show, which is great. So without further ado, um, from Sharon Lane, does a human target ever since they are being viewed? Um, there are people that have um, said that they can feel that if they're being viewed, um, I haven't felt that, um, but some of when sometimes, um, when we viewed, um, if there were, uh, aliens or bases, alien bases on the moon, uh, my partner actually was, he felt like he got stopped hmm. and he had to stop the session. So he felt blocked. Like he couldn't that get there, past a certain point. Is some sort of defensive measures put up there somehow to, to block people from viewing something like that? 
We believe that, I know it sounds crazy, but we believe that. We believe that there are certain things in place that can psychically block us Mm -hmm. from viewing certain things. I agree. Yeah. 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 Um, from Betty Lange, I know she's anxious <clears throat> to get this one answered. Uh, did Edgar Casey use remote viewing to di- to diagnose illnesses? You know, um, it. You know, again with the terminology, uh, but yeah, it so- It seems like he was doing more like what Vanessa talks about. He mm-hmm. was, um, you know, searching for. You know, we we do have a technique where we draw like a gingerbread man on paper and we use that to kind of sense things in the body. Um, So, yeah, I mean, why not? He he would actually go into the body. He would visualize actually going in as if you were doing, um, you know, remote healing. So he would actually go in and visualize that and be able to find the particular ailments. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because he was coming out with like very specific diagnoses and and remedies, and it was yeah, pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah, If any of your listeners, um, if they are interested, I'm. I I think you said that I'm going to be teaching remote viewing. It's a six week course um, on Saturday mornings for two hours for six weeks, and you get to learn all this, including what we call uh, med apps, um, and that is the healing part of it. Um, that we do towards the end, which is really cool. Um, so that's a lot of fun. And then also, if, if you want to know more about remote viewing, tonight on Midnight in the Desert, Angela T. Smith is going to be on. And she's been doing it way longer than me. And she's got cool, cool stories. So if, if anyone wants to listen to the show, midnightinthedesert.com. Cool. And the class, can that be accessed through your website? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's all there, and then you can message me if you have further questions. Okay, and we do have the uh, the website listed down in the description, so you guys can go ahead and uh, check that out, of course. Um, we'll take uh, one or two more here. Let's see. From Victoria Monday, can remote viewing be used in regressions, like go back in time and look around? Yeah, absolutely. We do that all the time. Um, you know, you can set tasking Say you want to know what happened, um, anything, you know, any, any kind of, um, event that happened in the past, you can remote view it. And, uh, we also will do, um, even ancient times, like, um, some, sometimes we've been tasked like, um, about the fifth dimension, what's it like Hmm. in the fifth dimension or what's, what's it like, um, uh, you know, the ancient alien theories. That's what we right. were doing um, at East study at, on um, ancient aliens. Um, any, any of those things. And you would be surprised that because you're blind, you're not slanted in any way. You get this really true data. So it's very cool. Interesting. And we'll do one more from Zippy Davis. Um, let's see. Do you think the new space force is dedicated to watch in advance of our world or do you think it has something? I'm not sure what's being said at the end here, but I guess would the new space force somehow be involved, you know, with all this, the new space force, is she talking about, um, star stars Academy or what space force? Um, uh, probably the one that Trump was talking about forming. Oh, she wants to know if remote viewing will be a part of that. Yeah, Zippy say he, but yeah. Oh, he well, you're talking part. about you're talking okay. about the uh, the moon bases, so that I probably yeah. tied into. I it. don't know. We can remote view it. There you go. <laughs> <I know. laughs> there you go. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I love I love. Um, you know, that's one of the things in our class. We at the first day of class, everyone gives me two questions they want to know, and then I like sneak them in uh, for homework and then they answer them. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Okay, Michelle, we're uh, right at our hour mark here. So how can everybody find you? I know I have the link in the description, but for our podcast listeners later. Um, So butterflyeffectcenter.com 
And uh, that's my website or midnightinthedesert.com. Um, our show um, is on Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was a really, really interesting mm-hmm. show and absolutely thank appreciate you. having I you on. I had so much fun. It was so <laughs> I really much fun. enjoyed this. <laughs> I, I love meeting you, Vanessa. I loved meeting you too. Okay. So right. um, we'll talk again. We'll talk later. Absolutely. All absolutely. Right. Okay. Take okay, care, Michelle. Thank Bye-bye. you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.